and suddenly I thought the electricity box outside the house was blowing up. Flash, flash, flash. I looked out. I'd never seen lightning like it in all of my born days. So if you, like me, had a fairly disrupted night's sleep, uh, we're not alone. There are tens of millions of people who today are talking about that extraordinary storm that swept over much of the country and coming on at half past ten to explain it all to us, including what is fork lightning, what is sheet lightning. Let's learn a bit this morning about it. It'll be John Ketley. But before I get to that, I'm guessing there are some people who will be even more shocked if they're Sunday Telegraph readers, and they've sat down to the eggs and bacon this morning to see a headline on the front page, Eurosceptics fear secret plot to stay in the EU. The electoral watchdog, the Electoral Commission, has received £829,000 to pay for its activities relating to European parliamentary elections, which take place eight weeks after we leave the European Union. Well, it's not April the 1st. Um, it's not some huge mistake. It's true. And to explain it all to us is Christopher Hope, the assistant editor and chief political correspondent for the Daily Telegraph. Good morning, Chris. Morning, Nigel. Well, I have to say, I mean, I, I'm, I'm quite certain people are looking at this and shaking their heads or maybe even shaking their fists or worse. Why? Tell us why, why, why has the Electoral Commission been given nearly a million pounds to help it prepare for next year's European elections? There's a legal requirement on them to do so. They got the money from a a committee normally chaired by the Speaker John Burko in March this year. Yes, him. Mm. In March this year, although he wasn't at the meeting when the money was cleared, because... The government's failed to get this EU withdrawal bill through the House of Commons. It's now been amended 15 times by, by peers. Um, and that bill, if passed, would remove the requirement on the Commission to hold the election next year. Because it's been delayed, they have to plan as though it might happen. And that's why they've asked for the money. That's why they've been given the money. And that's why they tell the Telegraph this morning that they need the money in the unlikely event that we have to go ahead with the elections. And that's why a lot of people, like you probably, Nigel, and other Eurosceptics, are concerned. It's a secret plan to keep us in the EU, just to hold the elections. Don't forget that the elections are held in May next year, and we're leaving in March. Yes, May 23rd to 26th is the timetabling for those elections next year. But I guess you can't really be surprised, in a sense, Chris Hope, can you, that people are getting a bit suspicious. I mean, every single red line we appear to have laid down, we've we've bent a bit. Uh, we've heard in the last eight, ten days that the Prime Minister now wants transition to go on until about 2023. I mean, a lot of people are asking, is this actually going to happen? I think there's increasing doubt. That, I mean, I think, I think the chance of leaving without a deal is increasing, because I think that the... Uh, EU is so intransigent on, on any of the offers with, that this government puts forward to them, on the Irish borders being used as a way to to, to, to kibosh any other deals about trade or anything at all. That, that this difficult um, uh, issue we have to resolve because it, 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 it's it's so balanced that it's very hard to put anything in writing about it as well. So I, I increasingly concerned. I think we we leave with no deal at all. Well, but if we leave with no deal at all, that will that will mean that the Prime Minister would need the House of Commons to sanction that. And, and that's what they are concerned they can't get. Of course, if the, if the offer is a bad deal or no deal, yep. if the bad deal is bad enough, they might vote for no deal, don't forget. And don't forget um, 8% of MPs voted in favour of leaving the European U- Union with the Article 50 bill, and thank goodness for Gina Miller, for a lot of Eurosceptics. Yeah, but I mean, surely if the House of Commons was faced with a no deal, given that so many of them support, still still support the European Union, wouldn't they vote for an amendment on a second referendum? Yes, they might well do. And then, of course, that might involve delaying Article 50, delaying leaving Well, next this, year. Is, this is what I'm coming to. Vote next spring. This is what I'm coming to, because already I hear the argument in Brussels, oh, well, Nigel, there's no point leaving. Um, you may as well delay leaving until transition ends. After all, otherwise, you'd be part of the, effectively still part of the European Union single market and customs union, but you wouldn't have any representation and you wouldn't yep. have a voice. So is it now a realistic possibility, not probability, but possibility, that Article 50 could get delayed from March 29th next year? 
I would say it's still, it's still a probability. If you talk to the government, they say we are leaving on March 29th next year. They say we're not. It's Andrew Donis and his his ilk who are saying we must delay that and have this second vote. I can easily see, though, that we, we end, up, end up never really leaving in this kind of purgatory if this carries on. I think the government, sorry, forgive me, I think the people who voted for leaving, the 17.4 million people yeah. demand to leave, and I think they are risking a lot by, by going against that. I can see that the, the issues, these are issues that must be resolved by both sides with goodwill. Yeah, they'd also be taking quite a risk, wouldn't they, with the European elections? Because if we, if we did contest those European elections... Um, I would have thought it likely that UKIP or something like UKIP could sweep the board. Yes, um, but would you stand? I mean, I, I heard this week you said, well, I'm, I'm off on March 29th, I'm not hanging around, even, even for, for um, eight more weeks just to be sort of paid to be a representative but not elected. Oh, no. My position um, is, you know, I will leave the European Parliament when we leave the European Union. So okay. if, we le- if we leave the European Union on March 29th next year, yep. I, I, I will have a little celebratory get-together on the night before, and yep. I'll be on Eurostar at lunchtime out of there, never to be seen again, which <laughs> Mr Verhofstadt and co may be very happy about, although the truth of it is, of course, um, I've given them more publicity, Chris, than anybody's ever been in the European <laughs> yeah. Parliament. Uh, but if we well, let's put it like this. If this country fights the next European elections next year, I'll be in the mix. Make no mistake about that. Um, and I think we would try and use it as a chance to teach them a lesson they could never, ever forget. Um, yeah, and, and, and it, could, it could almost give, give uh, UK, UK its mojo back. I think it probably would. I think it probably would. Chris, thanks for joining us on this Sunday morning. Well, you heard it there. Chris Hope, Assistant Editor and Chief Political Correspondent for The Daily Telegraph. And the point he's making, and it, you know, it is a valid one, is that because the EU withdrawal bill has not yet gone through the House of Commons, the Electoral Commission have to plan for the future. You know, until they're told we're not contesting the European elections, they have to make a contingency plan. Pity, isn't it? David Cameron and George Osborne didn't make a contingency plan for us voting to leave in the referendum, but hey-ho. So, let me ask you, let's debate this. Do you think we're leaving on March the 29th, 2019? And if you do then you better ring me up and reassure me, because I'm getting a bit worried. Call 0345 6060 973 and tell me, Nigel, there's nothing to worry about. Theresa is on top of the whole thing. Or maybe you think, actually, there's a great big conspiracy going on here amongst our political elites, and the truth of it is... The truth of it is, actually, there are many in the Cabinet that are part of it. Then text to 84850. Or maybe, as I say, you just think this is just sensible planning and we shouldn't get too alarmed, in which case tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC and LBC. And, of course, watch us on Facebook. We're live from London. Comment there, too. Bill is calling me from Exmouth in Devon, and he's a first-time caller to this show. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Sir Nigel. How are you, my dear fellow? I'm all right, but I have to say... Eh, do you know what, Bill? Every story that comes out, whether it's transition should now go on to 2023, whether it's the Prime Minister begging for us to be let in to all sorts of uh, deals like the European arrest warrant, just every single utterance I hear, Bill, um, I, 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 I just shake my head. Joe, no, Joe, I totally agree with you. I think from the day the referendum was called and uh, Cameron actually made it quite clear that we were no, not to do any feasibility um, planning for yes. a possible a vote. I think the establishment, I suspect most of the civil service don't want us to leave because they gold play everything Europe ever says. And quite honestly, I think that our society is actually being diluted to a position whereby there will be a second referendum and Europe are simply flooding uh, European people who will vote for either a remittance into Europe or we will never leave because all they're simply doing is they're simply kicking the can up the road for one day where transition will be no leave situation ever. Well, EU Citizens Bill did not have a vote, of course, in the last referendum, and nor should they if there's ever another one. Uh, yeah, but, 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 but that doesn't mean they won't change the law, will they? No, it doesn't do mean anything. it. think Europe will do anything. Look how many times the Irish have had referendums. Tw- yep, yep, yep. Uh, although, you know, although I suspect, Bill, I suspect, Bill, they won't be asked to vote on the abortion issue again. No, but, no. but, but hey, but, you but never know. Actually, but, but what I'm actually saying is, though, Europe doesn't take no for an answer, and it'll come back 
come back and come back until they will wear us all down. And within 25 years' time, we'll probably be going back to Europe because the demographic, demographic of this country will have changed. And this is what this is all about, really, isn't it? It's well, we may be saved, Bill. Thing. We may be saved by the Italians. The Italians may blow the whole thing up anyway, and there may be no European Union to rejoin. I don't know. No, no you know, but you know, the whole thing is, it, you know, we are not being led by a prudent British government, and they are being backed by a neoliberalist in the civil service to stop us leaving. This is profoundly undemocratic. If you didn't want us to leave, then you shouldn't have given us a referendum. And be careful for what you wish for, because people do not want to be controlled by a German state, to greater German state. Why is it that America can, uh, American taxpayers can sue BMW, Volkswagen for forcing um, sort of emission rules, and we're not allowed to do it because the Germans don't like it. Well, Bill, the Germans were, Bill the Germans in the end. In the end, though, Bill, don't you think that the way our political class are behaving is actually going to add to the number of people who think leaving is the right thing? I hope you're right. I hope you're right. I feel I am. I feel I am, but I don't know for certain, Bill. I don't know. None of us do. Bill, from Exmouth in Devon, thank you. And Bill, very cynical, very worried about all of this. And I'm, I'm guessing he's not alone this morning. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively in LBC, and it's now 10.15. This is LBC. Get a great new look for your home and pay less for it in the bank holiday event at Oak Furniture Land. Get 100% solid hardwood. Get a big surprise at all the different ranges in store and online. Modern, classic, even painted. And get up to 50% off. That's the Oak Furniture Land bank holiday event. But get your skates on. It ends Monday. Hello, car drivers. Do you like saving money? How about time? If you answered yes, then you should visit Confuse.com, where we guarantee to beat your car insurance renewal quote. And if we can't, we'll give you the difference plus £20. Can't believe your ears? Maybe you drove under a bridge and the radio went fuzzy, so let me repeat. The difference plus 20 smackaroonies. And now hear this loud and clear. Drivers win at Confuse.com. Full T's and C's online, single annual policies only. This is the sound of a broken boiler. Oh, and having to fork out for a new one. Oh! Uh. Then finding out you can get interest-free credit until the 31st of May. Oh! Not blowing your savings on a new boiler feels good. We're with you. Search British Gas New Boiler. Credit subject to status condition supply. We've got it at Selco. Selco, it's where the train go. At Selco Builders Warehouse, we've got real deals on a wide range of trade quality building products. In May, we've got 8 by 4 foot sheets of 18mm general purpose plywood for only £19.99 each x bat. Now that's a real deal. We've got even more real deals at Selco Builders Warehouse. For more information, see selcobw.com. We've got it at Selco. Selco, it's where the train go. Don't be taken for granted. Come get some big love at Big Motoring World. You'll love how big our choice is. Up to 2,000 beautiful used BMWs, Audis, Mercedes, and VWs. Already in waiting just for you. Big Motoring World. Minutes from the M25. See bigmotoringworld.co.uk. Now sing it. Big, big, big motoring world. Is your money working as hard as you do? Think about it. While you're grafting away, is your money working too? No? Then it's time to Wealthify. Wealthify is the smart, easy way to start investing. Just say how you want to invest. Cautious? Adventurous? Somewhere in between? And let Wealthify do the rest. Then keep track of your money on the app. Easy. Isn't it time for you to Wealthify? Download the app or visit Wealthify.com. With investing, capital is at risk and you could get back less than you put in. This is LBC, The Nigel Farage Show. Call 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage on LBC. Well, long-time Sunday Telegraph readers may well have sat down this morning having seen a bit of lightning overnight and about to tuck into the eggs and bacon and they see the headline, Eurosceptics fear secret plot to stay in the EU as we learn that the Electoral Commission have been granted £829,000 to prepare for us fighting the next set of European parliamentary elections which take place eight weeks after we're supposed to leave the European Union. Now, Chris Hope was on with us from a Telegraph explaining that... 
because the government's European withdrawal bill has not yet gone through the House of Commons, this is something they have to do. They're making a contingency plan. But, you know, we keep hearing, don't we, that, that uh, we're going to be delayed on transition, perhaps until 2023. We've already agreed to give away a huge amount of money, nearly £40 billion, um, as part of a leaving fee. And, of course, there was the backstop position that Theresa May agreed to in December because she can't satisfy Monsieur Barnier over the northern Irish border. And that backstop position suggests that we would stay in full regulatory alignment with the European Union, which, of course, leads the Blairs and the Cleggs and the Adonises and the Alistair Campbells to say, well, what's the point of leaving if we're still actually part of it, but we don't have a say? So we've got a government in some trouble. We will have a European Union withdrawal bill coming back into the House of Commons, looking, of course, particularly at those amendments that we saw from the House of Lords. That is all going to happen sometime in the middle of June. That's the best guess we've got at the moment. But I'm asking you, do you think we're leaving on March the 29th next year? I've always said we will be leaving. I've got no doubts we'll be leaving, but I'm beginning to become a little worried. What do you think? What does Keith think in Stoke Newington? Good morning, Keith. Yes, Nigel, good morning. Yes, Magna Carta says the people are allowed to rise up for a legal demonstration. This is this EU situation is getting totally ridiculous. All the all the leavers need to, to mass we need to go down to Parliament. We need to arrest these remainers, throw them in jail for treason. Because the people have made the decision and they've got no right to take the decision away from the people just for their own benefit. And that's what you've got to do because it's getting totally ridiculous. Now treason, Keith, would be acting against the state itself, wouldn't it? Um Sorry, Nigel, my throat, sorry, a big pardon. No, I'm just saying that... I couldn't hear you. You know, you use the word treason, and it's incredibly strong. Yeah. It, it is an incredibly powerful, emotive word, but yeah. it means somebody or, 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 or some groups of, of, of people acting against the interests of the state itself. I mean, I'm quite certain if we had Lord Adonis on, uh, he would tell us it's actually, in fact, in the interests of the state that we stay in the European Union. Yeah, but the point is, his argument is that he wants, when you analyse it, he wants to take the, the power of referendum uh, from the people and put it back in Parliament. That means Parliament's becoming a dictator. The, the decision has been made. And what we should be saying is, I'm sorry, we're leaving regardless. And once we've left, we will then open negotiations with Europe, if they want to, and take it from there. We're not doing this. Well, I think, Keith, the word is betrayal. It's a betrayal. That's, that's, that, 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 yeah, that's the word. Because, as you say, we're given a referendum, we're told, whatever you decide, we will implement. And now there are vast swathes of people trying to overturn it. Keith from State Newington, I thank you. Nick in Sevenoaks is pleased. He says, I'm pleased to hear there's further doubt over us leaving, looking forward to another referendum, and having a chance to stay in the Union with our European allies. Uh, which one, Nick in Sevenoaks? The... The Italian Eurosceptics, or will it be the Austrian Eurosceptics, or will it be the Hungarian Eurosceptics, or I mean, the idea, Nick in Seven Oaks, that everything is hunky dory on the other side of the channel. Actually, Brexit is not their biggest problem. The Italian government and the Hungarian governments pose them a bigger threat. Anyway, Nick thinks Brexit's on its last legs. Well, it may be as far as the establishment's concerned. My feeling is out there in the country, uh, if if if. if if even if they tried to make us vote again, I think they'd be very surprised by the result. Really leaving? Don't be daft. They're not negotiating deals. They're working out how to make not leaving look like leaving. I wonder how they'll do it, says Dave. Well, the Prime Minister's good at that because she wants to opt back in to virtually every single part of this European project. Ken says to me, I don't think we're going to leave. It's all a big con. And Giorgio in Bristol says, I want my cake and I want to eat it. What's the point in having a cake if you can't eat it? In other words, I voted to leave and that's what I want. Giorgio, there are a lot of people out there who voted to leave who are becoming, I think, increasingly angry. That doesn't mean that because this... £829,000 has been given to the Electoral Commission. That, that of itself is actually an establishment plot, but it does say that the government has got to bring this to a head pretty 
damn quickly. John is calling from Lawson. Good morning, John. Good morning. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, John. I can't sleep because of the lightning. And then I get up and look at the Sunday Telegraph. Um, and I'm not sure what to do apart from shout. Well, that's probably shouting's not a bad idea. I must admit, when I switched on the radio this morning and, and listened to the I haven't read the paper, but your heart is just sinking. I sink every time I hear a piece of news like this because I'm feeling exactly the same way. And um, I suppose I was... I mean, I voted to leave, and I, I placed a large bet, the opposite of what you should do. Yeah. I placed, I placed a bet on remaining because I so much wanted to leave that I, I thought, well, I could, um, how much money am I prepared to lose on remaining part of the EU. And I put a, a large sum of money down, and now I'm, I'm sort of wanting my money back, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's, like, it's like a double whammy. You know, you've not only lost your money, but now you now, haven't got the thing that you thought you were going to get. It's funny you're talking um, about betting, John, because I've got a little bet riding at the moment. I was at... Um, I had the good fortune to be at Lords on Thursday and Friday. Good fortune in the sense that it's a great place to be. Uh, England's, yes. cr England's cricket performance... Pretty lamentable, it has to be said. But I, I do have a bet on Joss Butler reaching a hundred, and I've, I've, I've oh, got, fantastic. and I've got the bet at seven to one, and he's sixty-six not out overnight. So I'm keeping oh. my fingers crossed on that one. But I tell you what, oh. but I tell you what, though, John, if he's out with fewer than a hundred, there's no chance of me ever asking for a rerun, is there? No, not at all, and that's the problem. That is the problem. It is. A bet's a bet, and, you know, a result's a result. They didn't say on the other side of the piece of paper, read for exit two, three, four, or five. No. It's quite simple. So any amount of not leaving on the date is, is, is against the will of the people. And so if, if, if the worst-case scenario, people, John... If the worst-case scenario comes along and we suddenly hear that because of technical difficulties and complications, it's been decided that, of course, we are leaving the European Union and Mrs May will stand up and say Brexit means Brexit, but it's actually more convenient now, John, for us to delay Article 50 by two and a half years uh, because that will time better through the transition period and enable us to have a voice in the corridor of power. How would you feel at that moment? moment? Well, I feel I'd be in some sort of bizarre animal farm book where all animals are equal and then you go on to say why you're not for the next period of time. So I think we'd be totally, totally 100% and, cheated. And would your instinct, John, be just mm. to give up and say to hell with all of it and walk away? Or would your instinct be to fight? Oh, fight every step of the way. And I think that that's not to be underestimated. I think that, you know, if you went through the depth and breadth of those people who voted, I think that the more that's gone on, everything we see every day persuades you exactly the reason why you should, should have been wanting to vote to leave in the first yeah, place. Yeah, interesting. John, John, thank you. Great call. Uh, Paul is calling from Edmonton. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. It's a pleasure to speak to you. I think our politicians in the past have signed us up to something that it's going to be virtually impossible to get out of. Is it, well, like sort of Hotel California, you can check out, but you can't leave. <laughs> that, that's right, yeah. I mean, I, I remember the, the, the wine mountains, the butter mountains, and the phases of this EU. It's just a big club, and it, 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 it's a joke. Well, it's, it's, it's a very... I mean, Paul, whatever problems it's currently got, it, it has turned itself into an incredibly powerful organisation. I mean, a new piece of legislation came in from the European Union just two days ago on data protection, and I'll be talking about that a bit later on on the show. And it does legislate and control many aspects of our lives. But there seems to be this narrative, Paul, that it's impossible to leave. I don't believe that. Well, I, I think they've signed us up to some, some uh, dod dodgy dealings that it's going to be very difficult... I mean, we, we don't hear enough from other countries and other manufacturers of what, what they've already told junkers to um, to calm it down because they're, they're getting a bit worried now. Well, yes, of course, because and exports. Well, yeah. I mean, if you're a German, you know, if you're a German car manufacturer or a French champagne producer or a Belgian chocolate maker. You know, kind of the UK market is one of your best markets in the whole world and you're trading with the UK at a massive surplus. So there is some pressure, Paul. There is some economic pragmatism being put on Juncker, being put on Barnier. Uh, but ultimately, ultimately it's Barnier that we're dealing with. And the one thing he does not want to happen 
is for Britain to be able to be seen to be getting a fair and reasonable deal. Because do you know what, Paul? If we get that, the Italian government will say, that's what we want. Yeah, I mean, another thing with this car manufacturing, it started off all, all, the, all the manufacturers come here from abroad to get over EU quotas, not because Great Britain is great. Well, actually, do you know what? When it comes to uh, car manufacture, you know, you look at the Nissan plant up in Sunderland, it is one of the most efficient car plants in the world. So let's not yeah, knock yeah. ourselves let's not, not knock ourselves too much. Paul, are we going to leave on March the 29th next year, yes or no? <laughs> I hope so, but I don't, it, it's looking dodgy. I reckon there'll be a transition period of about 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that was so bad I had to laugh. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. You're listening to the Sunday edition of The Nigel Farage Show, exclusive in LBC. It is now 10.30 and time for the news with Philip Chrysokos. Hundreds of passengers are waiting for their flights to take off from Stansted after the airport's refuelling system was struck by lightning. The cancellations and delays follow weather forecasts saying there were up to 20,000 lightning strikes across Wales and central and southern England, along with torrential downpours overnight. Organisers of a music festival in Portsmouth, where two people died, say they've cancelled today's event for safety reasons. An 18-year-old woman and a man of 20 fell at mutiny yesterday evening. South Korea's president says North Korea's leader is committed to holding a summit with Donald Trump, complete with denuclearization. Moon Jae-in has confirmed that after having been briefed by the US president having held talks with Kim Jong-un yesterday. LBC weather, isolated thunder and heavy rain to come in a line from North Wales across to the southeast of England. North of that, warm and sunny, a high of 28 degrees. LBC Travel, it's heavy on the M25 anti-clockwise in Buckinghamshire. There's a lane closed because of emergency repairs between Junction 16 for the M40 and Junction 15 for the M4. In Battersea, Latchmere Road is closed in both directions because of flooding between Burns Road and Sheepcote Lane. Road closures are in place in central London because of the Westminster Mile Run. That includes the Mall, Birdcage Walk and Horse Guards Road. At Stansted Airport, there are delays to flights after a lightning strike overnight that hit the refuelling system. On the Tube, there's no service on the district line between Turnham Green and Richmond. That's because of flooding and there are also severe delays on the district line between Earls Court and Kensington Olympia because of signal failure. LBC Travel Line, Dave Goff. This is LBC. The seven dwarves were in a bit of a pickle. With the mines closing down, their finances were somewhat fickle. They looked to downsize their home fast, so Snow White could make her debts a thing of the past. Boys, the cottage is looking well rough. So they spoke to the friendly team at Property Rescue, who buy properties in any condition and can offer a guaranteed sale in as little as two days, hassle-free. Fast forward to living happily ever after. Visit propertyrescue.co.uk. Property Rescue. Fast forward to sold. Car Giant, the only place for giant car choice and out of this world savings. With up to 8,000 cars in stock, visit Car Giant today. Clear a house, clear an office, clear a little bit, or clear loads of it. With Clear Ruby. Getting rid of rubbish is quick, easy and affordable. Choose our man and van rubbish removal service and we'll come and clear almost any rubbish from almost anywhere. Because whatever you want rid of, there's a Clearer Bee man in a Clearer Bee van who can do it professionally and legally. Book now at clearerbee.co.uk. Clear rubbish easily. Clear Bee. This week at Lidl, add a splash of colour to your garden with everything from hanging baskets to bedding plants. Get a pot of French lavender for only one eighty nine. Now there's a beautifully scented plant and a blooming bargain. Offer starts Thursday the 24th of May. Subject to availability and may vary selected stores while stocks last. Hello, car drivers. Do you like saving money? How about time? If you answered yes, then you should visit Confuse.com, where we guarantee to beat your car insurance renewal quote. And if we can't, we'll give you the difference plus £20. Can't believe your ears? Maybe you drove under a bridge and the radio went fuzzy, so let me repeat. The difference plus 20 smackaroonies. And now hear this loud and clear. Drivers win at Confuse.com. Full T's and C's online. Single annual policies only. Get a great new look for your home. Get 100% solid hardwood furniture. Get up to 50% off and get your skates on. The Oak Furniture Land Bank holiday event ends Monday. The Talk Talk Big Broadband Sale is now even bigger. Our unlimited broadband is now just $18.95 a month, including line rental for 24 months. With no broadband mid-contract price rises guaranteed. 
The price you see is the price you pay every single month. No other major provider can promise this. That's why we've been voted U-Switch Best Broadband TV and Home Phone Provider 2018. Hurry, offer ends 31st of May. Visit talktalk.co.uk. Talk Talk for everyone. Contract and condition supply, 995 delivery charge. Hurry into Home Base this bank holiday for 20% off all garden furniture. Offer ends soon, so don't miss out. Home Base, always your home, always low prices. Excludes clearance outlets. The Nigel Farage Show on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Is there a plot to stop Brexit from happening? And I asked that on the back of the fact that the Electoral Commission had been granted £829,000 to prepare to get ready to organise the European elections at the end of May next year, eight weeks after we're supposed to have left. Are we really leaving? And I've heard from a few of you already very concerned about this, but please, if you think it's a good idea that we fight the European elections next year, let me know on 0345 6060 973. Now, anyone living in the southern part of England, or I believe much of Wales, uh, cannot fail to have noticed the remarkable storms that we had last night. Um, Tens of millions of people will have seen and heard those storms last night. It's causing problems at Stansted Airport, so if you're flying from there, you best check, I think, before you go. Uh, To talk us through it all, we have course have our legendary weatherman John Ketley. Good morning, John. Yes, good morning, Nigel. Morning. So, I mean, I, you know, I, mean, I was in bed, I was kind of half asleep, <laughs> and, and I actually thought that the electricity sort of box had blown up, because it was flash, flash, flash. I know. I, I, I mean, and how big a swathe of the country did these storms affect? Well, they certainly came in from northern France. They were imports, uh, not for the first time. It's quite typical when you get temperatures of 28, 29 degrees across France during a Saturday afternoon, that uh, you start importing these storms storms into the UK and the southern England uh, area is always first to to catch them so they did arrive across the south coast right about I don't know, up past 10, 11 o'clock yesterday evening, yep. and they started moving northwards, and uh, London really did catch it. I've had a report this morning that 25 millimetres of rain fell at Twickenham Stadium, so we've got a match there again today, England playing Barbarians. Uh, but uh, yeah, sometimes it's quite welcome, that rain, but the thunderstorms are a much more serious event, as you uh, quite realise, and uh, there were said to be 15,000 lightning strikes across the country last night, and London certainly copped a lot of them. Uh, since then, the storms have moved and weakened somewhat, across the Midlands, up into North Wales, and more storms now are gathering across the Bristol area, so I don't think we're finished with it yet. No. And, John, lightning. I mean, I always thought there was a difference between sheet lightning and fork lightning. Because I mean, I, what I could see last night mm. were big... And, and s- simultaneously, lots of flashes across the sky. Yeah. So, so, I mean... Have we ever had as many lightning flashes as we saw last night? Well, we probably have. I'm not the expert on that. I'm not out there counting them. Well, I'll, <laughs> tell, you what, I'll tell you what, they were a remarkable number. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Tornado and Storm Research Organisation based in Oxford will probably have a very good idea as to how many strikes there were. A lot of it last night, I understand, was sheet lightning, which yeah. is the, the lightning that's going across at high level. That's what I saw, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Very little of it was actually fault lightning, which is the very dangerous lightning which strikes the ground, strikes buildings, strikes people. People, uh, suddenly, and um, thankfully we didn't have too much of that, but the, the sheet lightning was constant as far as I can gather, and that's probably because it was high-level thunderstorms, which is based on clouds way up in, this, up in the sky. OK, so maybe one more day of this and then back to normal? Uh, well, when you say normal, I, I heard you were saying that you're at Lords for two days this yes. week. So absolutely wonderful. I'm sorry I didn't get the invite. Uh, <laughs> but I, I've, I've spent many, many days uh, at Lords in, in the past 30 or 40 years. It's a wonderful place to be, but not when we're losing. But I do hope that Joss Butler gets his century today before any more storms arrive. And yeah, well, so do I. Yeah. So do I. I've, got my, I've got my money on him. Um, yeah, you, I know th- you no, have. No, yeah. Butler gets 100, then it <laughs> rains for the next two days. For English cricket, that'd be very good. Well, it isn't beyond the realms of possibility Ooh. there could be a draw in this because there will be more storms gathering. I've just mentioned to you there are storms now again across North Wales and Bristol and there will be more coming into the southeast for the afternoon. So I think it's across central and southern parts of England and into Wales where we are going to see more storms today. And as we saw last night, if you do get 25 millimetres coming down in less than two hours, it does take a little bit of time for the ground to dry out again and for everybody else to dry out as well. So yeah, there's more storms to come and more storms in the south again tomorrow.
I think Scotland and Northern Ireland is missing all of this fun. I certainly didn't see anything last night in Lincolnshire. Uh, I had a wonderful night's sleep, but thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> John, thanks for joining us. Well, that was John Ketley, legendary weatherman. And boy, they may have missed them in Lincolnshire, uh, but certainly in London and the South East and in many other parts of the country, I'd, I've certainly never seen lightning flashes like that in my life. Maybe it was all a sign. Maybe it was all part of the big conspiracy. Are we really leaving the European Union on March the 29th next year? All the way through this, I have thought, whatever concessions Theresa May makes, and I thought, you know, even wanting a transition period was ridiculous. Being prepared to give away up to 40 billion, uh, frankly, unnecessary. I've been unhappy with all of it. But I felt all the way through that maybe those concessions were being made. And the reason was just to get us over the line on March the 29th next year so that we actually left the European treaties. And I still think we'll leave on March the 29th next year because if we don't, there'll be huge public anger. But I have to say, even I begin to have my doubts. How does Andrew in Halifax feel about the whole thing? Good morning, Andrew. Oh, good morning, Nigel. Um, well, I, w- I've been a me- I was a member of the Conservative Party for many years, and apart from 2009 Euro elections when I did vote UKIP, I've always voted Conservative. Yeah. Uh, but I, I famously cut up my, uh, my membership card last September when uh, May announced uh, in a Florence speech that she was proposing this transition because I had a feeling that this sort of scenario was exactly what would come to pass. Uh, and I had uh, a lot of uh, arguments and disagreements with other members of the, the local Conservative Association who assured me that this was all tactics to try, as you say, get us over the line and get us out. Yeah. Um, I was sceptical then. I'm even more sceptical now. But by God, if, they, if the Tories don't deliver on this, then they deserve to be out of power, not just for one generation, but for several. And I say that as a Tory. Um- Andrew, as a you know, a Eurosceptic, and mm-hmm. I would say I wasn't say card carrying, but cut up card carrying member. Yeah, indeed, yeah. I mean, what do you? I mean, Jacob Rees-Mogg is the most prominent Eurosceptic now mm-hmm. in the House of Commons. He's leading the ERG group. They've got uh, the European Research Group. They've got about sixty MPs in their number. Mm-hmm. I mean, is it now beholden upon him to do something? Well, it is, but the ERG are not enough on their own. Uh, I mean, when you get people like Subri, who are determined to overturn the result, and incidentally, uh, when I rang her constituency office to to register a complaint, uh, I had the phone put down on me. That's the sort of contempt that her staff have for the people that she is betraying. Ah, but you're a little Englander, Andrew, aren't you? Of course, yeah. And bigoted, I expect, too. Well, it's funny, isn't it, that, you know, now that the abortion referendum in Ireland delivered what the establishment wanted, abortion, uh, suddenly referendums oh, are all tickety an exercise in open democracy to be well, welcomed and the people to be congratulated, is what Varadkar said. Yeah, exactly. But when it doesn't go the way they want or the way they think that it's going to go, suddenly we're, we're little Englanders and we're bigots and we're xenophobes yeah. and we're thick and we're, we're provincial and everything else. And I am utterly, utterly sick and tired. At the moment, living in this country stinks. Well, Andrew, are we going to leave on March the 29th? Are we going to creep over the line? Well, all I can say is if we don't, then I think the public will be understandably outraged. And if anybody ever comes to me asking me to condemn any civil disobedience that results from that betrayal, they'll be whistling the wind because I certainly won't be giving it. Mm, OK, Andrew. Well, I, of course, can't condone anything like that, you all understand. I've got the answer I want now on SMS. Good morning, Nigel. The rumbling in the night was the sound of anger of the British public at being sold down the river by the people in in authority in this country. I hope somebody would say that in response. D says, will the Electoral Commission give the money back if we do leave? Well, it's if we don't fight the European elections, D, but it's one and the same thing. Would that money then go back? I don't know. I mean, I have to say the Electoral Commission is just about my least favourite organisation in the world. Um, there are ten of them on the board. Four of them even since the referendum, you know, including their chairman, Sir John Holmes, have made statements regretting the referendum result. And they're made up of former uh, Lib Dem MPs and Labour MPs and Tory MPs. They've got one bloke who was a Labour MP 
an SDP MP and a Tory MP. Well, there's a principled sort of chat for you. Um, and I've... I fought, I fought the Electoral Commission all the way to the Supreme Court. They did their damnedest to bankrupt UKIP. They didn't quite succeed in doing it. And they, you know, they even allowed, in the last European elections, a party to stand with a name and a slogan that was so close to UKIP that 300,000 people mistakenly voted for it. So these people are not impartial. These people haven't cleaned up British politics. These people have been, frankly, a complete disgrace. Jim is feeling down on Twitter, he says. I really don't think we will leave. All these changes and constant remoning has made it pointless. And Tina says, if they force a second referendum, then the only question on the ballot should be deal or no deal. And no deal mean, means we leave without one. The Leave Remain argument has been dealt with and decided. Tina, it may have been dealt with and decided as far as you're concerned. It may have been dealt with and decided as far as about 70% of the country are concerned who just want the government to simply get on with it. But I'm afraid it is not a settled issue for our political classes, or at least for too many of them. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusive in LBC. It is now 10.45. This is LBC. Life is about sharing those magical moments, and food shouldn't be any different. For over 35 years, Marouche has been perfecting this experience with their delicious food, warm hospitality, and live entertainment. Authentic Lebanese cuisine made the traditional way. Marouche, your family restaurant. Book now at marouche.com. It's the last few days of the Furniture Village sale, with final reductions on a huge choice of sofas, beds and dining, including all our famous brands. So come in store or go online now, because we're sure there's something for you in the Furniture Village sale. But hurry, many offers end Bank Holiday Monday. Hello, car drivers. Do you like saving money? How about time? If you answered yes, then you should visit Confuse.com, where we guarantee to beat your car insurance renewal quote. And if we can't, we'll give you the difference plus £20. Can't believe your ears? Maybe you drove under a bridge and the radio went fuzzy, so let me repeat. The difference plus 20 smackaroonies. And now hear this loud and clear. Drivers win at Confuse.com. Full T's and C's online. Single annual policies only. Whoever they want to be in life, give them a great start with Wellkid. Carefully balanced, great tasting vitamins and minerals for 4 to 12 year olds with specific nutrients such as zinc and vitamin D which support normal immune system function. The Wellkid range from Vitabiotics from Boots, Pharmacies and Vitabiotics.com From the age of three young Mozart would watch his sister play the harpsichord with their father mesmerised by the sound. An early obsession from which his love of music blossomed. At Darwood and Tanner, we believe obsession is a good thing. It's what motivates us to create the perfect smile for every patient, day after day. Darwood and Tanner, your smile is our healthy obsession. Visit darwoodandtanner.co.uk. The Nigel Farage Show on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Brexit means Brexit. No deal is better than a bad deal. We will leave the single market, the customs union, and we will leave the European Union on March the 29th, 2019. Not my words, but Theresa May's words. And since those days, since that great Lancaster House speech, which I are here on LBC lauded uh, as, 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 as the best speech I'd heard from a modern British politician. Since then, it's all been foot dragging and delay. Since then, it's all been Monsieur Barnier dictating terms, asking us to jump, and the British government, frankly, saying how high. It's all been done, I think, because they wanted to get us over the line on March the 29th next year, when at 11 p.m. we are due to leave the European Union treaties, the big historic break. There are many, of course, that don't want that to happen. And I think if you look at today's front pages, particularly the Sunday Telegraph, who led with it in a, in a very big way, uh, now very much a feeling uh, that perhaps it isn't going to happen. Is it or is it not going to happen? John in Glasgow, is it happening? 
Nigel, it's happening. I'm afraid you're getting everybody all excited and bothered. Oh, I no, no, John, I'm not. <laughs> I, I'm not, John. The front page, the front pages of the newspapers are. I'm just debating the issue. I still think, John. I still think we are going to get over the line uh, because I feel uh, that that to delay Article 50 by say a couple of years or whatever, I don't think I don't think public anger would stand for it. Well, I think this is all uh, a bit uh, too sinister for on a Sunday morning on a bank holiday weekend. It's a red herring, uh, Nigel, because all this is is effectively somebody being caught with their hands in the state subsidy till here uh, to avoid a few redundancies that the uh, self-licking, self-lollipop, self-licking lollipop that is the Electoral Commission, um, because they would have to let some people go between now and next year. Um, they've simply said to the government, um, well, we're here, this is a growth industry, uh, holding Welsh elections, Scottish elections, oh, yeah. European elections, national elections, mayoral elections, um, uh, and now we're looking at contracting. Um, well, just let us have the money, and the simplest thing for the government to do is to just let the money go through to them uh, to continue preparing for something that won't happen uh, to stave off the evil day uh, of some redundancies there. John, let me tell you what's not a red herring. What is not a red herring are those 15 votes that took place in the House of Lords that are now coming back to the House of Commons and likely to be debated and voted on sometime in the middle of June. And in particular, John, was one. It's on the Customs Union. Are you absolutely confident that the Prime Minister has a majority on that in the House of Commons? Um, well, there's certainly uh, other dangers in the wing, um, as far as that's concerned. But this is an absolute red line of her election manifesto. Well, uh, if it comes to that, there'll certainly be huge amounts of trouble. Um, the, the Electoral Commission angle, though, to be honest, uh, uh, they, 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 they're simply just uh, protecting their, uh, their own little empire. No, and I, 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 uh, yeah, and I understand that. And, and, and it's nice to know that at least one part of the state is preparing for the future, unlike Cameron and Osborne, with the referendum itself. But, John, the point I'm making is this. There is going to be a big moment at some, t- at some point in June on that customs union vote. What if... And, and at the moment, you know, she's either going to win it by five or six votes or lose it by a couple. I mean, that's how tight this is. What if she lost that vote? What would happen? Well, there is a possibility of another uh, general election. Yes, it there is. Not, it, it may not be a bad thing because it would certainly shake up uh, probably uh, 20 or 30 of the numbers in the House of Commons because the Scottish Nationalists would certainly lose at least another 10 to 15 MPs there. Um, the question is who would replace them. Um, but uh, that that would certainly uh, shake the pack up somewhat. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. well, John, you know, I floated this um, on this very programme a couple of weeks ago, and I think we were the first uh, national programme to suggest that a general election could be coming down the track. So a general election is one possibility, but another possibility, John, is that she decides that it's all a bit too difficult and they're going to suspend Article 50 for a year, two years, three years. I don't think that'll wash. They've already watered it down uh, to, to us leaving effectively now at 2020. I think if, if she came along with that proposal, there would, there would be uh, effectively a general election because I, I just don't see uh, that getting through Parliament or the electorate. Uh, that, that is too much of what They've watered it down so far. They waited nine months to, to come along with Article 50. The I know, two years, I know. The two years is there. Now it's another... Transition. Eight, oh. <laughs> uh, you, you, can only, you can only kick the can down the road so far uh, and I do think that uh, there is an increasing uh, likelihood uh, of a general election coming down the track. It would be no bad thing, certainly from a Scottish point of view, because it would get all this nonsense about another <laughs> Scottish so-called independence referendum off the table because the, the, the SNP would get another slap in the face as far as that's concerned. Uh, that would be the only positive well, lining in it. Well, that's your view, John. That's your view. Elections are funny things. Thank you very much indeed for your call. Dennis is in Bournemouth. Hi, Dennis. Hi, oh, good morning, Nigel. Good morning. So are we leaving on March the 29th next year with fireworks and big parties? Well, I think that if we, the Brexiteers, if you like, don't get our act together, mm-hmm. then we're not going to leave. Um, if you take me, I mean, I live in Dorset. Mm-hmm. Um, where is the focus for me um, to um, express my opinion with millions of others against what is happening? Now, if we look at the other side, they are well organised, they're determined, they're committed. They've got a coherent strategy um, to overturn Brexit. All started with Gene, Gina Miller, etc. Mm-hmm. 
where do, where, unless we achieve a coordinated response, this is the Brexiteers, then Brexit is dead in the water, in my opinion. Difficult, though, to be coordinated, isn't it? I mean, I remember, Dennis, back in the run-up to the referendum and the referendum itself, uh, you know, spending... Well, I wish I hadn't bothered, but spending <laughs> countless hours to try and get everyone to work together under the same umbrella to cooperate. But the Tory Brexiteers didn't really want to work with anybody. It's not easy, is it? Well, that is a mistake. I think that's a mistake that Rhys Mogg is making. I spoke to Rhys Mogg on your programme. He sees it as a Conservative issue. This yes. is not a Conservative issue. This is a national issue. Now, if we look at the various groups that are around, you've got Leave Means Leave. Yep. We've got Campaign for an Indi- uh, Independent Britain. And uh, You've got the yep. ERG group. Yep. There's no coordination. There's no national franchise that I can go to and millions of other people can go to to voice uh, anger um, and our disquiet, uh, disquiet about what the government's, government's doing. No, Dennis, we've that... Stop, we've got to stop talking... And we need action. Well, the point is, Dennis, the reason that doesn't exist is because Theresa May, you know, has claimed that territory as being her own with the Lancaster House speech, with what she said in the general election. The message has been, you can all pack up and go home. You're not needed. We now have a Brexit-supporting Prime Minister. That's, I think, actually, Dennis, more than anything, that's the reason we've got that, that we face the potential difficulties that we do. I couldn't agree more, because when you look at it, this is actually not a government issue. The government's got a legal responsibility to express um, the wills of the people, will of the people in terms of, um, in terms of Brexit. Mm. And they're fiffing and faffing around right from the start. It's too late now. Right from the start, there should have been, this should have been cross-party. Now, I'm concerned that Parliament is overwhelmingly weighted in favour of staying in the European Union. Which it is. Now, where is the countergroup? That's my question. I mean, you're in contact with people like Aaron Banks and so on. What we need is a franchise. I'd be happy to represent Dorset, if you like, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So would a lot of other people. Um, we need, it needs money. It needs coordination. But would the, conservati- would the Conservatives work with it? I, I think we should almost forget about the Conservatives and, and co- concentrate on Trouble the is, people. Dan- Trouble is, Dennis... Concentrate th- on the constituencies. Trouble is, Dennis, they're in government. Listen, get... I work with I work with Leave Dodie um, and we had eighteen different organisations together under the same umbrella, including the new Communist Party of Great Britain and George Galloway. And I was perfectly happy to work with people with different political viewpoints. The one group of people it's virtually impossible to cooperate with are those from the Conservative Party. It's very, very difficult indeed, Dennis. I thank you. Uh, On Twitter, Patrick says, the EU's behaviour during these negotiations has been dubious, but Nigel is deluded if he thinks people are more likely to vote leave in any further vote. Well, Patrick, I think uh, there is a sense... Uh, a, a sense amongst the British people, if we if we were to, to be asked to vote again, that would be frankly not very far away from outrage. I've got time for one last very quick call. Jim in Dartford, good morning. Good morning, Nigel. Firstly, I think if we don't leave March 19th, uh, 29th rather, um, be a mass backlash in the local elections and the um, EU elections. I need to ask you a quick question. Uh-huh. When you're talking to John Ketley, yeah. you're talking about two days at the Lords. Yeah. Is that the closest to the Lords you're going to get? Oh, it? absolutely. Very good, Jim. <laughs> yeah, Lords cricket grounds about as much as it's going to be for me. It's funny, I was told on the Friday, um, oh, David Cameron's um, on the lawn uh, drinking a glass of Pims. Why didn't you go over and say hello? And you know what, Jim? Nothing could have been further from what I wanted to do on a Friday afternoon at Lord's. Jim, you've made your point. Thank you. And Jim makes this point that if we don't leave on March the 29th next year, there would be a huge political backlash. You know, one thing I know for certain is that the effect of UKIP, when it was rising through the polls in 2012, 13, winning the European elections in 2014, the impact that it had on the Labour vote, ultimately, in 2015, the last thing either Labour or Tories want is a resurgent UKIP party. I promise you, (laughs) if we don't leave on March the 29th next year, if this is delayed by a couple of years, if we do fight those next European elections, I promise you, I'll be there fighting them, and next time, it'll be no more 
Mr Nice Guy. OK, looking ahead, Jeremy Hunt has said people want to pay more tax to fund hospitals. The Health Secretary has said that people recognise that through the tax system we'll end up having to contribute more to support the NHS. He says there is a willingness to do that. Mm, interesting. Provided they can see the money goes to the NHS, provided they can see it's not being wasted. I'm asking you, would you be happy to pay more tax, perhaps a lot more tax, if you thought it would help the NHS? If you say, yep, I'm happy to do that, call 0345 6060 Maybe you think you've paid enough already. In which case, text to 84850. Or maybe you think, actually, a lot of it gets wasted. In which case, tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. Watch us on Facebook and comment there too. On your radio, on your phone and here. Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, at 11 o'clock, hundreds of passengers are facing long delays as they wait for their flights to take off from Stansted after a lightning strike took out the airport's refuelling system. Some planes heading to Stansted have been diverted to East Midlands Airport, more than 100 miles away, others to Luton and Southend. Andy Murphy is one of those who's been left stranded. He's spoken to LBC from Stansted. They forced everyone to board the aircraft and we've been sitting on the aircraft since 10 to 7 this morning. Overnight, there were more than 20,000 spectacular flashes of lightning across Wales and central and southern parts of England, coupled with strong winds and torrential rain. The storm is being described as the mother of all thunderstorms. Forecaster John Ketley has told Nigel there's more to come. There are storms now again across North Wales and Bristol, and there will be more coming into the southeast for the afternoon. So I think it's across central and southern parts of England and into Wales where we are going to see more storms today. As we saw last night, if you do get 25 millimetres coming down in less than two hours, it does take a little bit of time for the ground to dry out again. So, uh, yeah, there's more storms to come and more storms in the south again tomorrow. I think Scotland and Northern Ireland is missing all of this fun. I certainly didn't see anything last night in Lincolnshire. In other headlines this hour, the second day of a music festival has been cancelled following the deaths of two people. An 18-year-old woman and a man of 20 fell ill at mutiny in Portsmouth yesterday evening. Organisers have warned of a dangerous high-strength or bad-batch substance on site. The husband of British mother Nazazine Zagari Radcliffe has told LBC he's still hopeful of her release following reports she's to face a new trial in Iran. Richard Ratcliffe says he hopes to get clarity and hold talks with the Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson. The President of the Supreme of the Revolutionary Court announced that she'll be back into court on security-related charges. He didn't specify. Last week, she met with the judge who said it was another charge of spreading propaganda against the regime, and her lawyer hasn't been told anything yet. We'll know within a few days, I think, when she's in court and, and what the exact charge is. The Justice Secretary Secretary has given the strongest hint yet that more women who commit non-violent crimes will be spared prison. David Gorg says the government's delayed plan on female offenders due to be published last year will be released in his words very shortly. A new generation of national parks could be developed in England. The Environment Secretary Michael Gove has announced a review of protected areas and areas of outstanding natural beauty. It'll look at how conservationists can improve wildlife and support people who live and work in the parks. Liverpool's footballers have arrived back in the the UK after they lost 3-1 to Real Madrid in the Champions League football final in Kiev last night. Goalkeeper Loris Karius made crucial ever errors while Mo Salah was substituted after injuring a shoulder in the first half. These Liverpool fans in Kiev have told LBC they're devastated. Two goalkeeper mistakes and that was pretty much it. I think the flow of the game changed when Salah went off. Just depressed the way we gave him two goals, gave it away like that. Otherwise we were in the game. LBC weather, isolated thunder and heavy rain in a line from North Wales across to South East England. North of that, warm and sunny, a high of 28 degrees. From Global's Newsroom, for LBC, I'm Philip Krasikos. OK, children, settle down. Thank you for bringing your pets in for Bring Your Pet to School Day. Megan, who is this delightful little ball of fur? It's Trico, my guinea pig, miss. Adorable. And Alfie, who's this? It's Ronaldo, my rabbit, miss. What a darling. And what's in the wooden crate, Poppy? Fluffy. That's a very strong lock. <laughs> With a Land Rover Discovery, adventure can take you, well, anywhere. Never stop discovering. Search Land Rover Discovery. Land Rover. Above and beyond. 
LBC travel is heavy on the M25 anti-clockwise in Buckinghamshire. There's a lane closed because of emergency repairs between Junction 16 for the M40 and Junction 15 for the M4. In Battersea, Latchmere Road is closed both ways because of flooding between Burns Road and Sheepcote Lane. It's slow in Bromley on the A21, Bromley Common Northbound because a manhole's collapsed at Southlands Road, that's near the petrol station. At Stansted Airport, there are delays to flights after a lightning strike overnight that hit the refuelling system. And on the tube, there's no service on the district line between Turner Green and Richmond because of flooding. It also means there's no London overground between South Acton and Richmond. LBC Travel, I'm Dave Goff. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. The Nigel Farage Show. Good morning. So does the Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, speak for all of us? He seems to feel pretty confident that he does when he says there is a willingness for us to pay more money in taxes, provided people can see that it's going to the NHS and that the money is not being wasted. What sort of money is Mr Hunt talking about when he speaks on our behalf? Well, I'll tell you, he's talking about taxes needing to rise by up to £2,000 for every household. So is this something that you would be prepared to do? Are you prepared to pay more tax if you thought it would help the NHS? And if you feel you'd be happy to dig deeper, then call me on 0345 6060 973. Or maybe you think, actually, you're paying enough tax as it is, in which case text to 84850. Or maybe you're suspicious that actually that money isn't going to be very well spent, in which case tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And, of course, you can't just, just watch us on Facebook only. You can comment using that medium too. So what do I make of all of this? Well, I have to say uh, that I'm not convinced that just throwing vast sums of money at a problem is necessarily the right thing to do. I think we've seen, you know, over the course of the last few months, uh, for example, health tourism once again being spoken about, and we debated it, in fact, last Sunday on this show, uh, and yet, within some parts of the National Health Service, uh, almost no desire at all to deal with that issue, just easier to turn a blind eye. And also the whole drug procurement programme of the NHS, uh, where in many cases uh, drugs that can be bought quite cheaply over the counter um, are being sold to the NHS for vastly inflated sums. And all right, I get it, Jeremy Hunt. I know there is an ageing population. I know uh, that there are now medical procedures available to people that simply didn't even exist a few decades ago. I understand there is a money problem. There is also, of course, an exploding population, which nobody talks about. You know, they say there are 65 million people living in this country, but we all know the true figure is a fair bit higher than that. Compare that to 25 years ago when it was 55 million. So, I mean, these are all very real issues. But I'm going to say no. I'm not happy, uh, Mr Hunt, for you to speak on my behalf. I don't think an extra £2,000 a year would actually get bang for the buck. But also, and here's a very important point, the idea that you pay a portion of your tax and that it directly goes to one part of government spending, it's called tax hypothecation. It doesn't exist, even with the road tax. It doesn't go to pay for the roads. It just goes into the pot. National insurance, which was sold, of course, to the country back in the late 1940s as being the money that would be spent on the health service. Oh, no, it doesn't. It just all goes in to a great big central pot. The money goes into that pot. The expenditure comes out of it. And, of course, <laughs> because one doesn't meet the other, we have to go to the markets and borrow every year. And we're still running a deficit of about 50 billion sterling every single year, despite the fact that at every general election, we're told, during the lifetime of this Parliament, we'll end the deficit. But we don't. Tax hypothecation does not work. And it's a cheap... It's, it's cheaper... You know, it really is sort of left-wing populism 
to say a penny on tax for schools or tuppence on tax for the health service. Um, it just doesn't work. And I'm amazed that a Conservative Party, who are supposed to be the ones, you know, who know about financial responsibility, are even putting this idea forwards, though some cynics would say they aren't necessarily particularly Conservative. Let's go to Terence, the first time caller to this show. He's calling from Stoke Newington. Good morning, Terence. Uh, morning, Nigel. So, would um, you be happy you... to pay two grand a year more from your household straight to the NHS? Well... I've got three points to make, really. OK. The, my, the, the way forward for, for, that I see would be the best way forward is to, in the first instance, have an entitlement card, which meant that everybody that was entitled to use the NHS had a card to prove that they were entitled to use the NHS, leaving aside the issues of how we'd implement that, et cetera, to one, for, for one moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. The second instance really, go, really follows on from what you said, about the way tax and then national insurance all mingle together. Yeah. I would actually like to see on my, my, my monthly pay slip an actual amount of money that says specifically that I am paying X amount for, for the NHS. Then I think in terms of democracy, when there's an election, people can be, said, can be told, we are going to spend X more amount on the NHS. That will mean... So that bit on your pay slip that says you're paying £2,000 a year or whatever for the NHS is going to go up by £200, £300. And I think people would start beginning to understand how much it actually costs to fund the NHS and would be able to make a democratic choice about how much money they wanted to put into it. And it might be that the British population is actually quite happy to put more money into that. <laughs> Right. So, Terence, how long do you think that pay slip would be? Because if the pay slip told you how much went to the NHS, how much was spent on defence, how much went no, on... No, 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 that's not, that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting specifically... Oh, no, no, no. You can't single out one area of... Ex one, just one area of expenditure. I mean, that would, be, that would be unfair to the other decisions that government needs to make, surely. No, I don't think so. I think in the case of the NHS, we, we you know, we have one large national institution that we're all very proud of, that does a very good job for the country, etc. But I think when people talk about this one pence on income tax or NHS, etc., and they're, they're basically, they don't know where the money's going. But if you knew... That but you wouldn't know. But, but, Ter but Terence, you wouldn't know, because, because actually the money does come out of a central pot. It's almost impossible, Terence, without setting up whole no, new departments. No, 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 no. Well, I, would, I wouldn't say it was impossible. I'd say this, that, that would well, be the way forward, well, because when you went to vote in the elections and, some, and a party said, we're going to spend so many more billion on the NHS, you would know that that part of your, of your um, uh, contribution to society is coming out of that bit in your post that, that says NHS, and when it goes up, say to 20 or 30 but you pay another 200 quid in tax and you might find that only 20 that you might find that only 30 quid of it goes to the nhs well we've got to make sure that the money within that right. pot does go to yeah, the nhs fine, fine which needs setting up whole new government departments because you'd have to bypass the treasury and all the existing apparatus that collects tax and spends money i understand emotionally why people think it's a good idea. Paddy Ashdown did this back in the 90s with education. You know, penny on tax for education. These are cheap political sound bites, and I, Terence, would have expected better from a Conservative government. But listen, I thank you for, for your point, and we'll come back to Terence's point about, enti about entitlement cards, stroke ID cards, over the course of the programme. Uh, cut overseas aid and stop HS2, says Frank from Ryslip. Oh, come on, Frank. HS2's only 60 billion quid, and think about it. I mean, you'll be in Birmingham ten minutes more quickly. Surely worth every bean. Let's go to Lynn in Birmingham. I didn't even know I was going to Birmingham next. Lynn, after HS2, we're going to be with you more quickly from here. Hello, Nigel. Good morning. Before I go on about the NHS, I agree with everything with you. So that's all I need to say. Thank you. Uh, my NHS. Yes. Uh, now, my son died last October. Sorry to hear that. And it was through bad patient care. Now, I think I'm 81 years old, Nigel. Yeah. And I worked from 16 years old until 68 years old. And the 
care that I've had from the NHS has been an absolute disgrace. The care my son received in hospital for five weeks, I can't begin to tell you. So I think Mr. Jeremy Hunt, who incidentally I wrote to four times, who didn't even have the decency to write back and answer my letters, I consider that the money that I've paid in all my life, right to 68 years old, I should have had better care and attention in my life, as well as my son. That's really all I've got to say. Is it possible, then, and I'm, and I'm you know, sorry to hear you've had a very, very sad uh, last few months, but is it possible, then, that Jeremy Hunt would answer you by saying that if there was more money for the NHS, you both might have received better care? Maybe, but I consider the nurses that were in... Do you know, Nigel, I, I don't want to go into it, but every day I went in to see my son, I, I went to the nurses' station every single day. There was no response. They didn't care. They were walking about. I consider that non-patient care. Right. And so I will never forget it because I consider the NHS, above anything, the best in the world. But what I received this last year... I, I'm sorry, I don't anymore, and I am disgusted by it. Well, and I do wish that Jeremy Hunt would do something about this because it's going from bad to worse. Well, maybe, Lynn, I don't know. That could, be an ar- that could be an argument for more money, but it could be an argument for reform and a change of culture. Lynn, I thank you for that uh, sad story. You're listening to the Sunday edition of The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, and it's now 11.15. Sheila Fogarty, Monday to Friday from 1pm. We're not coming at this from remotely the same angle. You clearly think that there's been a UK state abduction of two people on the streets of Salisbury. I think that's a crazy suggestion. You can't even go around to take some women's magazines to her, could you? I don't think you're doing much of a job of journalistic by finding out nothing about her. And pretend- Tell you what I'll do, I'll read some women's magazines and improve myself. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. My house, my office, they're a mess. You need London Storage Vaults. Their self-storage units are in an underground vault near Oxford Circus, so they're completely safe. They're also climate controlled, so they're ideal for anything from paperwork to fine wines. Sounds great. They'll collect your stuff for free if you're in Zones 1 and 2. There's 24-7 access and all from just £10 a week. London Storage Vaults, the future of self-storage. Visit londonstoragevaults.com. Terms and conditions apply. Alexa, who is the best English rugby player of all time? Good question. My favourite is Johnny Wilkinson. Really? Oh, nice one. Alexa, who is the greatest rugby player of all time? My favourite is definitely Sergio Perez. Oh. Take out Vitality Health or Life Insurance today and you could get an Amazon Echo Dot, just like Johnny. And to find your inner athlete, enable the Vitality Alexa skill for fitness and nutrition tips. To get your Amazon Echo Dot, just search Vitality. New member offer available on certain Vitality plans until the 30th of June 2018. Minimum monthly premiums, terms and conditions apply. Don't be taken for granted. Come get some big love at Big Motoring World. You'll love how big our choice is. Up to 2,000 beautiful used BMWs, Audis, Mercedes and VWs. Already in waiting just for you. Big Motoring World, minutes from the M25. See bigmotoringworld.co.uk. Now sing it. Big, big, big Motoring World. Looking for a better return on your savings? You could earn up to 5.35% tax-free interest per annum by investing in Cufflinks Innovative Finance ISA. Join thousands of investors who are earning more from their savings today and visit cufflinkisa.co.uk to get started. That's K-U-F-L-I-N-K, cufflinkisa.co.uk. Capital is at risk, rate based on a five-year fixed-term investment. You should seek independent financial advice. Your future is here. The Global Academy, a forward-thinking state school for 14 to 19-year-olds interested in a media career. Visit globalacademy.com to find out more. There's only one way to take afternoon tea. With fresh scones, clotted cream dams and jam, and finger sandwiches. There's only one way to serve a Manhattan, with rye whiskey, sweet red vermouth, and Angostura bitters. 
And there's only one way to sail transatlantic. On the world's only ocean liner, Queen Mary II. With a thrilling arrival past the Statue of Liberty into the city that never sleeps. Yes, there's only one way to sail transatlantic, yet so many possibilities on board. With Cunard. Get a great new look for your home. Get 100% solid hardwood furniture. Get up to 50% off and get your skates on. The Oak Furniture Land Bank holiday event ends Monday. Leading Britain's conversation, The Nigel Farage Show. Tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage on LBC. Is the Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, right when he says we are willing to pay an extra £2,000 per household on average to the National Health Service, provided we know the money's going there and it's not going to be wasted? They're the caveats that he did put on. And I'm not. I'm not. I'm not convinced the money would get well spent. I'm not even convinced much of it would get there because we don't have tax hypothecation. We don't pay X pennies in the pound to the health service or Y to defence or whatever else it may be. The system just doesn't work like that. And I have to say, I think for a... You know, I mean, I'm not surprised Paddy Ashdown did it. He was never going to be in government. That was easy. You know, that was easy for him to say a penny on health back in the 1990s. But I am surprised that a senior government minister is kind of suggesting this to people because it just factually isn't true, given how our system works. I don't want to pay more, as there is too much waste in the NHS. What about the people who pay for private health care, says Claire? Well, Claire, I'd have thought the more people we can encourage to pay for private health care, the better. Because that surely takes pressure off the National Health Service. Nigel, does the NHS need more money? The new sugar tax is a great example of how we can raise additional revenue. It will raise a quarter of a billion pounds. Such taxes should be extended, such as an NHS levy on all junk food, alcohol and tobacco. Andrew, it doesn't work like that. I know this, in theory, sounds fantastic. You know, all right, all tobacco taxation goes to the NHS, but it doesn't. It goes into a central pot. And by the way, uh, for those, and this might surprise one or two of you, uh, tobacco revenues, they're down a bit, mostly because the taxes are so high that people are buying smuggled goods increasingly. But tobacco taxes, roughly 10 to £11 billion pounds a year into the UK economy, and the cost of treating tobacco-related diseases two to two and a half billion pounds every year. But it's still... These aren't direct trade-offs. That is not how our system works. I talked earlier. I mean, you know, entitlement cards came up a bit earlier. Now, whether we call them ID cards or whether we have national insurance cards to which we add our photograph, you know, I'm not sure. But I do begin to get the feeling particularly as health tourism has been back on the agenda over the course of the last few weeks, I do begin to think there is a bit of public appetite out there for people to have entitlement cards. And I think if they did have them, maybe then, Jeremy Hunt, that might be one of the factors that makes them a little more willing to pay more tax. But up to £2,000 for every household, yep. We're living a long time, and we have got and we do face huge problems for the future. But the idea people would willingly pay it, and it would go from one to the other, just, I don't believe, is right. I really don't. Um, let's get to Alan in Hartlepool. Good morning, Alan. Good morning, Nigel. Yeah, my point is, if the NHS is so desperate for cash, how is it they can afford to continue to pay six-figure salaries to chief executives? Like, for instance, the one we have in North... Let's... I I can't go into individual uh, authorities, Alan, but the general point... Yeah, the general point... Yeah, yeah. No, look, you're absolutely right. Um, Big money is paid to chief executives, um, and you say six-figure money. Um, In some cases, very big six-figure money is paid. Alan, the argument you would get back from Jeremy Hans and others is that... If you pay the big bucks, you get people who are of very high quality and they will make sure that the local area's health provision and, indeed, where it sources its its drugs from and its staff from, Alan, they will do the job so well 
that you may pay them a couple of hundred thousand pounds, but they will effectively save the taxpayer millions. That's the argument, Alan. Well, we know that's not true, don't we? You can't buy talents. We've seen that on the football field. <laughs> <laughs> the chief executives. Oh. They're paying all this money. That, so if that was the case, why aren't they paying nurses what they deserve? Instead of the 1% the increase they were on. Well, these chief executives and all the pen pushers and paper shufflers below them are all on fantastic money as well. It's totally out of balance. Well, the thing, the thing, Alan, that gets me a bit about this is that since 1997, you know, the growth of middle management staff in the NHS has been over 40%. And I just can't, for the life of me, work out how bureaucratic the whole thing has become. Um, and I think... I, Alan, I tell you what, I, I personally actually don't mind paying chief executives well if they are going to save millions and millions. But I suspect that your suspicion that in many cases they're not doing that. Um, most people, Alan, would share your point of view. Thank you. Let's go to Catherine, who's calling from Romford. Good morning. Hi, Nigel. So would you be willing, Catherine, to pay more taxes if, you, if, if it went straight to the NHS? In a word, no, because like you, I think there's a lot of wastage. I think that if I paid more money in tax, presumably for the NHS, I don't think that it would result in an increased quality of care. I think the money would go directly to these big pharmaceutical companies who are charging extortionate prices for drugs in some cases. Yes, yeah, some of the examples are just extraordinary, aren't they? You know, of, 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 of things that we could buy ourselves, Catherine, for a few pounds, you know, over the counter in, in, in any well-known pharmacy chain, um, which then, when they're sourced to the NHS, in some cases, cost hundreds. Yes, exactly. And also other drugs like epilepsy drugs. Also, I specifically know about a thyroid drug called T3, where a company was charging a 6,000% price hike. I so saw that story drug, too. Yeah. 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 So instead, of the, instead of the drug costing £25 a month, as it would be in many other countries in the world, it's costing £900 in the UK. So the NHS has been paying that. So I think the NH we have to really get that under control before we start paying more in tax to the NHS. Yeah, I mean, as I say, Catherine, a lot would argue we're paying enough already. But, but also, do you understand my point and I, I, when I say that actually taxation goes into a central part? It doesn't go directly to the health service or defence or anything else. Yes, I, I would definitely agree with you there. Yeah, and yet he's... very concerned that the money wouldn't get to the NHS. Yeah, so he's kind of giving a slightly misleading view, isn't he, Jeremy Hunt, of the way in which government really operates? Yes, because I don't see how they can guarantee that the money would go well, to the precisely. NHS. Precisely. Under our system, it can't. Catherine, I thank you very much indeed for your call and your view. And Catherine, suspicious of where the money goes and how it is spent. Hi, Nigel. The NHS is part of a civil service and funded by government. But since Blair, the NHS has had a lot of changes. Now it is mismanaged by all the middle management that interfere in all aspects, is what Louise has to say. Mal on Facebook says, the NHS was not built for drug addicts, alcoholics or obesity. Well, uh, now that's a very interesting one. Uh, there are, there is certainly a school of thought uh, that is gaining ground that says uh, that if people have uh, self-inflicted illnesses through obesity or various forms of drug addiction, that the NHS shouldn't treat them. But Mal, you know, we're a civilised society. We're not going to leave people to sort of die on the front doorstep. Oh, you know, you know sorry, you've been drinking too much. We can't treat you. Um, although anyone that works in A&E would be pleased if the country as a whole drank less, given that on Friday and Saturday nights, a lot of them are frankly like war zones, and I wouldn't want to work in one. Whatever you paid me, it must be horrendous. Dave is calling from Hammersmith. Good morning, Dave. Hi, Nigel. So, I, come I on, are really, you a big Jeremy Hunt supporter? You happy to shell out two grand for the NHS? I'm not really a supporter. I think he's gone about this the whole wrong way. Okay. He, what he did, he started off by cutting money drastically. Probably, um, well, different numbers vary, but probably about 30 billion in real terms since 2010 because of the indexing. Now, 
when you give a set of managers, you run a business, you give a set of managers a job and you say, you've got to do the job with less money. What do they do? They don't sack themselves because turkeys don't vote for Christmas. And what we're talking about here is 415 Mm. boards of directors, 415 chief executives, 415 PR managers, 415 everything. They're making the same decisions. Is cancer more important than arthritis? Of course it is. Well, let's let's prioritise that then. These are the same decisions. You'd also, having run your own business and been in your own business, know that you focus on the big costs, the big mistakes costs, like PFI. There are uh, clauses in PFI, non-performance clauses, that could be exercised to get rid of that complete... I mean, that's what bankrupts trusts PFI. Now, well, it, I mean, David, that, but, I mean, you're clearly very knowledgeable on this, but one or two hospitals that I've spoken to saying that these PFI deals, which, which were presented as some sort of miracle in the late 1990s, actually, the overhead of that is ruinous for many of the new-built hospitals. It is. They can't change a light bulb. £250 to get somebody in to change a light bulb. Mm. They can't change uh, the thing that shuts a door. So then they can't use a whole room because they're breaching a fire regulation. The stuff that goes on is ridiculous. He cut the the SHAs. So he cut those. Those very same people were paid 50 grand in um, redundancy only to be re-employed by GPs. He created a massive increase in the appetite for risk. And that's really what, what's at the core of the NHS. Do we let patients die? You know, what's the risk factor? Now, at the same time, we had Blair to blame for a lot because he brought in a system that says your trust has a certain amount of money. Every time somebody elects to go for a private surgery, for a private thing, what happens is that money is taken taken out of the NHS budget for that trust and paid to that private institution. These, these so-called prices were put on those, and that's stealing money from, you know, from... So is, the is, is Dave wholesale reform the first thing that needs to happen? Well, I think, first of all, what you do is you say, right, so if, if you've got these private organisations who are taking um, clinicians out of the NHS for sometimes four to five days a week, mm. and they keep, some of them keep in for one day a week to keep their pension alive, they should actually be paying, it costs over £5 million per doctor to actually <coughs> train them. So they're not contributing to that. Uh, we have to have the teaching hospitals, we have to have the environment that teaches doctors. But the, but the private people do not pay a penny towards it. Yeah. But da- they're taking money. Dave, the deeper you go into uh, this... The deeper you go into this, the more that needs to be done. Thank you. And in the interest of fairness, of course, it isn't just people like Jeremy Hunt, Remainers in modern parlance, who talk about more money for the NHS. Some will remember Boris Johnson talking about £350 million a week that could perhaps have been spent on the NHS. And you could argue that was a form of a promise of tax hypothecation, which is actually rather difficult to deliver. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. It's now 11.31 and time for the news with Philip Chrysokos. Hundreds of passengers are stranded at Stansted Airport with cancelled flights while some arrivals being diverted to other airports. It follows a lightning strike on its refuelling system overnight where the forecasters say there were up to 20,000 lightning strikes across Wales and central and southern England along with torrential downpours with more to come in those areas through the rest of today. The Justice Secretary says middle class drug users should feel in his words, guilty and responsibility for the increasing knife deaths across the UK. David Gork says those recreational users at dinner parties are in part responsible for the violence on the streets. Organisers of Mutiny Festival in Portsmouth have cancelled the second day of the event following the unconnected deaths of two people yesterday evening. Those organisers have warned of a dangerous high strength or bad batch substance on site. LBC weather, isolated and heavy thundery rain in a line from North Wales across to South East England North of that, warm and sunny, a high of 28 degrees. LBC Travel, it's very slow on the M1 northbound. It's partly blocked because of an accident between Junction 10 for Luton Airport and Junction 11 for Dunstable South. It's heavy on the M25 anti-clockwise in Buckinghamshire. There's a lane closed because of emergency repairs. That's between Junction 16 for the M40 and Junction 15 for the M4. The recuse in Harold Wood, the A127 South End Arterial Road is closed until Tuesday morning. It's because of roadworks between Squirrels Heath Road and the A12 at Gallows Corner. There are delays to flights in and out of Stansted Airport. So that's after a lightning strike overnight that hit the refuelling system. And on the tube, there's no service on the district line between Turnham Green and Richmond because of flooding. LBC Travel, I'm Dave Goff. This is LBC. After working as a solicitor, Musin Ishmael changed to a career in teaching. He tells us why. 
There are two parts that make teaching really interesting and um, something that I uh, get up in the morning want to do every single day. And the first part is the actual bit in the classroom where you get to inspire young people, which is really engaging for me. But there's also the leadership part of it, which was always really my interest when I left law. Get into teaching and enjoy a truly rewarding career. Find out more at lbc.co.uk. Ah, the Caribbean. Another cruise, another me. Will I discover my adventurous side ziplining over treetops in St. Kitts? Or lift the lid on my foodie side on Antigua with a luscious lobster lunch? I could explore the delights of a spiced rum on St. Lucia. And back on board, cap it all off tonight and unleash my inner diva on the dance floor. Cruise the Caribbean from just 1399 per person for 13 nights and explore the world in you. Now with £340 per cabin to spend on board. P&O Cruises. This is the life. Subject to availability based on B906A JE grade. Conditions apply at or protected. This is the sound of a broken boiler. Oh. And having to fork out for a new one. Oh. Then finding out you can get interest-free credit until the 31st of May. Oh. Not blowing your savings on a new boiler feels good. We're with you. Search British Gas New Boiler. Credit subject to status, conditions apply. It's the last few days of the Furniture Village sale, with final reductions on a huge choice of sofas, beds and dining, including all our famous brands. So come in store or go online now, because we're sure there's something for you in the Furniture Village sale. But hurry, many offers end Bank Holiday Monday. You've worked hard, your company has flourished, and you're deservedly reaping the fruits of your labour. However, you're now ready to retire and call it a day. But how do you ensure an orderly exit to realise maximum value from your business? At Barnes Rofe, our specialists have been busy helping clients with bespoke succession planning and business exit strategies. Call us today to help plan for your retirement. Barnes Rofe, clever accountants for mature businesses. Mission Control, come in. This is Mission Control. What can you see out there, Ted? I can see the Great Wall of China, the Grand Canyon, and is that... No, it can't be. Car Giant. I can see Car Giant. Wow, it really is big. Car Giant, the only place for giant car choice and giant car savings. Over. It's how London buys its car. Leading Britain's conversation, LBC, The Nigel Farage Show. Well, Jeremy Hunt seems to speak for all of us, saying we'd be very happy to put more money into the National Health Service, perhaps up to £2,000 per household if we were happy it wasn't being wasted. Hmm. Calls and, uh, calls and texts and tweets I'm getting wouldn't necessarily back that up. Now, on Friday, a new piece of legislation came into being, the GDPR. It's been agreed at European Union level, and despite the fact we have a Brexit government, Mrs May has said, we are not only opted into it now, we will stay a part of it. It is a piece of legislation that potentially affects a lot of you out there running businesses if you collect or keep data of any kind at all. Yeah, I feel, for one, there's been far too little explanation of what this is, and certainly polling that I've seen, suggesting that a lot of businesses didn't even know it was happening. And surprisingly, over the course of this weekend, the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, and other big US news sites, if you go and try and find them, you get redirected to a page saying that at the moment they're unavailable. So a lot of US-based websites are currently you know, shut off to internet users across the European Union. So to, to examine both of these things, try and get some explanations, I'm going to go to Suzanne Dibble, a data protection lawyer. Good morning, Suzanne. Good morning, Nigel. Good morning. So um, am I right in saying that there's been too little explanation by government of this change in the law? I would agree with that, Nigel. I run a Facebook group for 35,000 small business owners called GDPR for Online Entrepreneurs. And certainly there are still people coming into that group who have only just found out about GDPR. And they're in a panic because they know that the regulations came into force on Friday and they're already worried about being non-compliant and being fined 20 million euros. Now, of course, my approach in that group is very much to reassure them 
and to tell them that that isn't going to happen. But yes, I do absolutely agree with you that I feel that the government and the Information Commissioner's Office could have done a lot more yeah. to make more, particularly small businesses aware of it. Yeah, and these fines are horrendous, because yeah, it can be up to £20 million, uh, that, you, that you can be fined, or 4% of your business. I mean, it's, you know, it, and, and, and that is basically for not having... Sufficient consent, would you say, Suzanne? Is is that the right way to describe how people's data needs to be accessed and used? Well, GDPR is a lot more than the emails that we've seen into our inbox last week asking for consent. And the ICO have said that the, the, the maximum fines will be reserved for the most serious breaches. So no, I think that not getting the right tick boxes is not going to end up with any kind of significant fine or possibly any fine at all. But it is obviously the, the headlines of the fines being 20 million or 4% of your uh, global turnover. So in Facebook's case, for example, if they were um, levied the maximum fine, it would be $109 billion based on their last year's turnover. <laughs> yeah. um, so yes, I mean, understandably, these headline fines are very concerning to small businesses. And although the ICO, to give them credit, have on every opportunity tried to reassure small businesses, uh, unless small businesses are uh, seeing the ICO's press release or going onto the website and reading it, what they're reading is in the newspapers um, in the last week or so, and understandably they're panicked about it. Now, of course, legislation of all kinds often has unintended consequences. Why is it that the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune and other American news sites are unavailable now for most of us living inside the European Union? Well, I obviously don't know their internal workings. I can only guess that they're not as prepared for GDPR as they hoped they'd be. However, they do say that they're engaged on the issue and committed to looking at options that support their full range of digital offerings in the EU market. So I can only assume that maybe they weren't aware of it, of it as soon as they should have been. And, but, 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 but Suzanne, these are... complex data business. But these are... Ri- time to comply. These are big, rich media organisations. I find it... Yes, you would have hoped that they'd been ready. But I think, I mean, the message certainly is not that they are cutting off their EU market. And I think that that is it's what I see in my Facebook group. And we're getting more and more U.S. companies joining by the day. But the initial knee-jerk reaction when they hear the headline fines of 20 million is to think, right, well, I'm just going to block the EU. But once they actually re- realise that it isn't so arduous to comply, they soon realise that actually keeping their audience to a potential 500 million users in the EU is far preferable to cutting them off. Okay, and finally, Suzanne, a personal view from you. Do you think this general data protection requirement is the right way for us to go? I do. It's coming from a very good place. If you think about it as a data subject, I'm personally very reassured that organisations are going to be a lot more focused on keeping that data secure. If you think about it, data has changed so much in the last 20 years since our last data protection laws came in. The value of data, it's, well, data is now the most valuable asset in the world, and the way that we process it is, is significantly different to how it was 20 years ago. So, yes, it's coming from a very good place, this regulation. It's just I think that we'll see a few teething problems in implementing it. And the ICO has stated this is not the, the, the deadline of the 25th. It's not the end. It's the beginning. And yeah. I think that putting privacy and data protection at the heart of organisations can only be good for the data subject. Terrific. Thank you very much indeed for joining us and explaining all of that. Suzanne Dibble, data protection lawyer. So if you are running a small business and you're scared, there are websites. She runs one. There are websites out there where you can go to find out what you need to do to be compliant. Um, it, it is not unduly onerous, but a lot of people are quite scared because you don't hear anything about it. And then you hear, gosh, they might want 20 million from me. So I'm not surprised people are worried. So we're back to... This £2,000 per household that is needed to pay for an ageing population that Jeremy Hunt thinks we're willing to pay if we feel the money goes straight to the NHS and it's not going to be wasted. And I made the point earlier in response to an SMS message. You know, I said, actually, we should be encouraging people uh, to go privately to lift the burden off the NHS. And Lance in Fulham, you get text of a day, Lance, because you say, hi, Nigel, we could all get private medical care for £2,000. So Lance's point is, rather than giving two grand to the government, who of course can't guarantee it'll go to the NHS, because we don't have tax hypothecation, it goes into a central part, and rather than trusting them to spend the money, 
we could get better health care for ourselves for that two grand. And Lance, tell you what, it's pretty difficult, in my opinion, to argue against that. Do you remember when 11 billion that the NHS wasted on a failed IT system about eight years ago? I would not trust them with any more money, says Mike in High Wycombe, and yes, they did blow an extraordinary sum of money on a new failed IT system. Ian is calling from Beath up in Glasgow. Good morning, Ian. Hi, good morning, Nigel. How are you? I am... Well, I'm all right. I mean, you didn't get the thunderstorms up there, Ian, did you? No, we did, we did not. We've got Nicola Sturgeon. Do we need any more? <laughs> There's enough thunder comes out of Hollywood. Right? <laughs> well, <laughs> you could probably say that of all people in politics, Ian. So, Ian... Uh, I, I mean, I think I've won the lottery here because I've tried to talk to you so many times in this show, but here we go. Right, well, you've got through... You finally got through, Ian. The floor is yours. Are you happy to pay a lot more money for, to tr- and trust Jeremy Hunt to spend it well on health care? Absolutely not, because he couldn't run a bath. Right. No. But, he, but he, mean, he's, a, he's a highly um, university-educated, intelligent man, Ian. Nigel, there's a saying that us, or those of us who weren't lucky enough to go to university have, it's that those that went to university have loads of brains, but no common sense. Right. And I'm telling you, when you look round that government we've got, Scotland, England and Wales, doesn't matter. There's not a lot of common sense. <laughs> but, However, but the trouble is, Ian, the, NHS, the trouble is, Ian, we've got an ageing population here. We, we, we genuinely do. So, so, so what are we, we going to do to provide a reasonable level of care in the years ahead? Well, Nigel, I'm 75. Right. <laughs> I'm 75, so I'm one of those ageing population. <laughs> I spent, I, I mean, I think over the 75 years I've spent no more than two weeks in hospital. Yeah. And the last time was a couple of years ago when I had eight days. Mm-hmm. Now, had they said to me, we're charging you for food, because if you'd been at home, you'd have had to feed yourself anyway, I would have happily paid it. And That's I don't see any reason why they shouldn't do that. Say, five or a day for your food, mm-hmm. eight days in there, £40, mm-hmm. you couldn't get a meal outside for £40. Well, do you know so what? I think they need to look at this in a whole... Do you know what, Ian? I'd never even thought of that. But as you say, if you were at home, you'd... Yeah, if you were at home, you would be buying food. And of course you and would. And you, yeah. might, you might go to the shops and stop for a £3 coffee. Why so many people do that's beyond me, but hey. Uh, and, and me, Nigel. <laughs> I don't understand it. I, I'd rather invest it somewhere else, in, in, in perhaps the public house. But anyway, Ian, you make a great point, and thank you for your call, and well done for getting through. And That's a very, very good point that he makes, isn't it? That actually, things like that could perhaps save the NHS a real big lot of money. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusive in LBC. It's 11.45. Coming up at 12 on LBC, Majid Noirs. The Justice Secretary has claimed that middle-class drug users are to blame for the epidemic of stabbings in UK cities. Should middle-class dinner parties feel responsible and guilty for death on our streets? Majid Noirs on LBC. Looking for a mower that's a cut above? Check out McCulloch Petrol Lawn Mowers at B&Q. Powerful and reliable with a Briggs & Stratton engine and a high-quality full steel deck. They're ideal for medium to large gardens and start from £198. So for a McCulloch Lawn Mower that's powered to get the job done, you can do it when you B&Q it. Winston Wolf here. Now picture this. You're cruising along listening to the radio. Maybe you stop for a muffin on the way. It's all rosy. Until bang, you're in Pothole City. And your blood is boiling. But then you remember you're with direct line. So, unlike with other insurers, you won't lose your no-claim discount when you claim it's not your fault. There's only room for one rocky road in your life. And it's got tiny marshmallows. Hit a pothole, your no-claim discount is safe. Can your motor insurance do that? With comprehensive cover as standard. Excess as apply. Underwritten by UK Insurance Limited. This is the sound of a broken boiler. Oh. And having to fork out for a new one. Oh. Then finding out you can get interest-free credit until the 31st of May. Oh. Not blowing your savings on a new boiler feels good. We're with you. Search British Gas New Boiler. Credit subject to status conditions apply. My house, my office, they're a mess. You need London Storage Vaults. Their self-storage units are in an underground vault near Oxford Circus, so they're completely safe. They're also climate controlled, so they're ideal for anything from paperwork to fine wines. Sounds great. They'll collect your stuff for free if you're in Zones 1 and 2. There's 24-7 access and all from just £10 a week. 
London Storage Vaults, the future of self-storage. Visit londonstoragevaults.com. Terms and conditions apply. Just one look it's the last few days of the Furniture Village sale, with final reductions on a huge choice of sofas, beds and dining, including all our famous brands. So come in store or go online now, because we're sure there's something for you in the Furniture Village sale. But hurry, many offers end Bank Holiday Monday. Mission Control, come in. This is Mission Control. What can you see out there, Ted? I can see the Great Wall of China, the Grand Canyon, and is that... No, it can't be. Car Giant. I can see Car Giant. Wow, it really is big. Car Giant, the only place for giant car choice and giant car savings. Over. It's our London. Nigel Farage Show. Text 84850. £2,000 per household on our tax bill. Jeremy Hunt, the Health Secretary, tells us we're willing to do it, provided we're happy the money's going to go straight there and it's not going to get wasted. And it's very difficult for either of those things to be promised to anybody. Rick on Facebook says, following up a theme that we had earlier, NHS chiefs get paid more than our Prime Minister. They should have their pay capped at 50000 a year. But, Rick, what if, what if you got in an NHS chief who was a real hotshot, who understood efficiencies, who got saving money, who dealt with procurement? What if somebody saved millions every year for one of the 400 or so health trusts? Wouldn't you be happy, Rick, in that situation to pay her or him more money? I, I, I don't think this is about the pay of any individual, but I think what it is about is a massive growth in mismanagement, in mismanagement, middle management, something, I may have well got that right first time round, um, over the course of the last 20 years. Um, I get this anonymously. I've worked on the front line of the NHS for 15 years, and regardless of which party is in power, there are never enough resources to provide consistent, safe patient care. But just throwing money at the NHS and taxing uh, the British taxpayer won't solve the problem unless the whole system is reviewed and looked at like any other failing business. Too many non-clinical managers, and that's a very... Very common complaint from people that work within the National Health Service but are nearly always very reluctant, for understandable reasons, to give their names. The NHS is a colossal bureaucracy. Bureaucracies are inherently wasteful. The more money you give the NHS, the more money uh, that it will go on spending on increasing its own headcount. Some will go to nurses and doctors for sure, but a lot will go to administrators and bureaucracy, which is wasteful. There will never be enough money. Well, no, look, uh, there will never be enough money. It is literally a black hole, because the more money you've got it within it, yes, not just only does the system system itself get bigger, but actually, with medical technology, the things that people demand from the NHS grow in scope too. So it is kind of endless. Ben is calling from Sydney. Hello, Ben. Oh, hi, Nigel. Uh, pleasure to talk to you. Good morning. So, is, is, that, is that Sydney, Australia, or...? Yeah, Sydney, Australia. So right, I, well, I wasn't sure. Happen. OK, so, how do things work there? Yeah, so I've my wife and my um, young son. We pay about four thousand three hundred dollars a year. Yes, in um, private, um, and then we get a tax rebate at the end of the year, um, which makes it worthwhile for us. Yes, that's 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 in Aussie dollars. Yeah, that's Aussie dollars. Yeah, so I don't know what the exchange rate two thousand one hundred pounds or whatever. Okay, so yeah, let's call it a couple of grand. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Just, 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 just for simple. So you spend that money. Getting your own private care. Yep. And you get a tax rebate. But what happens, Ben, if you're, God forbid, but if you're in a road traffic um, accident, emergency situation, what happens then? So I'm, I'm, I've chosen, like, the f fully covered. So it's, yeah, I'm covered. Exactly like I would be back home, apart from it's private. And is it compulsory? to have uh, private, or if you're not in private... You, so if you're not in private, you're in the state system, yeah? In the state system, yeah. Right, 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 right. So you've been... In, OK, I've got it. You've been encouraged 
through tax incentives yeah. to come out. Do you know what, Ben? I, I have to say, I have talked about this going back a few years, and I've talked about it over the course of the last 50 minutes or so as well, that actually the more people in your position, then actually the freer resources are for the rest of the National Health Service. I'm Nigel, I'm 27, I'm a carpenter, I'm by no, I'm not a rich person, and it works fantastic for me. And how long have you been in Oz, Ben? Um, coming up eight years. Coming up eight years. And when you first went there, I'm guessing there was no automatic health care anyway for you. Well, it was, um, I was, I came out here on a backpacking visa, and there's, is it reciprocal health care anyway? for the first two years and then okay. I got sponsored and, and part of my sponsorship visa actually which is interesting is I had to get private health care which should be the case in the UK uh, well, I, I, but, yeah. an argument that uh, since you've left the United Kingdom eight years ago an argument that has raged here as I'm sure you know Ben listen great call really really interesting that isn't it you know, that's how the Australians do it. They encourage people to opt out of the state system, take private care. They get some tax incentives for doing it. I have to say, I did suggest that many, many years ago, because I was screamed at by everybody, uh, for not supporting the NHS. But actually, the more, the more people opt out of it and, and, and do things privately, um, surely the more resource there is for the NHS itself. Andrew is calling from Loughborough in Leicestershire. Andrew, good morning. Good morning, Nigel. How are you? I'm well. So are you happy to cough up another couple of thousand of your taxes for a wonderful new health service? I am, and there's a way of doing it which every MP, including Jeremy Hunt, has totally missed here, and my local um, MP, Nicky Morgan, has as well. OK. Is nobody needs to actually pay any more. We could put £10,000 in more person. And where would this money come from, Jeremy? It would come from this foreign aid budget, which is bloated at £13 billion today. <coughs> There's so much money there. Or, is, or, or Andrew, remembering the referendum, once we're not paying membership fees to the EU, that might help a bit too. Uh, yeah, I had that on my list as well. <laughs> yeah, right, but uh, what, why is nobody waking up in government and, and that money needs to be moved today? We need to look after ourselves before we give charity beyond our home at the end of the day. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, if we stopped our net... Con I mean, our net contribution to the European Union is about £10 billion, although it's going to be going up substantially during this... I think during this um, transition period to about fifteen. Um, uh, foreign aid as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, th 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 there is a substantial amount you could do for the National Health Service with that money. But generally, Andrew, the point, of course, is that however much you pour into it, it always wants more anyway. Oh, totally, and that's what's happened with foreign aid. It's the end of a target, and the more you give them, the, the more it's wasted at the end of the day. And the same happens a bit with the NHS, with the, with the medicines, o inflated prices. Mm. We need to wake up. They need to get their head out of the sand, the government, and start taking control of this money, not asking for more. It needs to be more resourced at the end of the day. Right, so a redirection of how of our national government spends money, yeah? T totally a redirection of it. And yeah. I've requested with the government that the public should have a say of how this money is actually spent, and they're not interested in any public view on it at all, and I think that's undemocratic. Difficult, though, isn't it, Andrew, because there are so many different things that government needs to spend money on. Uh, to ask people directly for a say on how stuff is... How would you do it? You would have a um, vote, vote online to, to, uh, whereby p anybody who is a UK taxpayer can actually tick to w where it should be spent. Well, it's, it's uh, do you know what? It's, it's a, it's, it, in one way, it's an extraordinary liberating idea, but it would produce total chaos, Andrew. Well, it needs it. You can't go on the way it is because the money has just been a high percentage. It goes to good causes, but a high percentage is actually squandered, as we all know, and it, it, it can't continue. No, I think we all feel that. I think we all feel that. Andrew, thank you very much. And Andrew taking high tax hypothecation to a level where we'd almost have a referendum on it and where we wanted our money to go. It simply can't work, folks. That's my view. What does Harvey in Hounslow think? Good morning, Harvey. Good morning, Nigel. How are you, mate? I'm all right, thank you. So, another 2,000 quid from your household and all our health problems will be fixed. No, thank you. Um, I've got a report in front of me from the Taxpayers Alliance. It says that in 2014, 120 billion of wasteful spending came from our government. Yeah. And according to their statistics, that's 4,500 every week and... It tells you a lot of what it's being spent on, but there's loads of factors. 
we we should uh, stop health tourism as well, really. We don't know how much that costs. Well, I know, Harvey, but those of us that have made that argument have been denounced as small-minded bigots and evil people. Oh, I guess I am. We should open our yes. hearts to a broader world. We should allow anyone in to get health care. No, Harvey, I do understand that argument. I mean, one of the things that is coming out of all of this is more and more people thinking that perhaps we need to have entitlement cards that we carry with us for health care. Would you go along with that? <laughs> no. I think uh, the government's duty is uh, towards its people and not the people of the world. I mean, we elect them, the world doesn't. But if you had an entitlement card, we'd know who you were, Harvey, wouldn't we? Well, that's true. Yeah, that is true, actually. It does have a point. It does have a point. Harvey, I thank you for your call. I thank all of you for your call. Angela on Facebook says, private hospitals don't tend to have an A&E. No, Angela, which is why I asked the question. And even if we're encouraged to opt out and get private health care to relieve the burden on the NHS, if we were doing that solely, we would still need accident and emergency. And that point is absolutely valid and true. You've been listening to The Sunday Show here with me, Nigel Farage. I'm back tomorrow night at 7 o'clock from Strasbourg. At 3 this afternoon, it's Andrew Castle. But up next, it's Majid Nawaz. Thank you, Nigel. Coming up, the number of people being temporarily housed in emergency accommodation has grown by 500% since 2009. Are we returning, returning to Victorian levels of inequality? Before that, Philip Hammond has warned Theresa May that he will agree to billions more being poured into the NHS only if ministers accept cuts to other services like the police. What services would you cut to spend more on the NHS? But first, Justice Secretary David Gork has claimed that middle-class drug users are to blame for the epidemic of stabbings in the UK cities. But the war on drugs is an abject failure. Gangs no longer kill each other over the alcohol trade, although they once did. Should middle-class dinner partiers feel responsible and guilty for the death on our streets?